And I'd like to give the floor to Carlota Rebelo, who is at NATO HQ with the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's highest level official, which is very exciting. So Carlota, the floor is yours. Thank you, Donna in Miami and earlier Sarah in Stockholm. It is indeed an absolute pleasure to be here at the NATO HQ to conduct this transatlantic conversation with the Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg. Thank you very much for having me in your home. Uh, it's a pleasure. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the audience here with us at the Agora, comprised of young NATO staffers and interns. I'm sure they're very eager to hear your thoughts on the future of the Alliance and the future of the world. So thank you and hello. Thanks so much, uh, Carlotta. It's great to be with you here in Brussels. Uh, and also hello to Sarah in uh, Stockholm and uh, Donna in Miami. And also told that in Miami, uh, the president uh, of Montenegro, uh, Milatovic, is there together with you. And uh, Montenegro was actually the first country I had the honor and pleasure to welcome in as a new uh, NATO ally when I uh, became Secretary General. Uh, they joined it back in 2017. Um, uh, so it's good to be together with all of you and, uh, and uh, to be able to again, again engage with and talk with uh, young uh, people. And not least then also to the first time to engage with Sweden, uh, who is our newest member. We raised the Swedish flag outside the NATO headquarters not so many months ago. And it's good to have Sweden as a full member of the alliance. Well, it has been great to seeing it out there as well uh, while here in Brussels. Well, let's look ahead to July. That's when uh, NATO will hold its summit in Washington and it will mark the 75th anniversary of the alliance, uh, but also will address some of the very serious issues and challenges. So I'm curious to hear from you. What are some of the key threats faced by NATO allies and what are we doing to solve them? So NATO faces, of course, many threats and many security challenges. Uh, we live in a world with more uh, great power uh, uh, competition, uh, uh, also uh, uh, with China. Um, but we have, uh, on top of that, of course, uh, uh, a new war in the Middle East. Uh, and we have a full-fledged war in Europe with a brutal war aggression uh, launched by President Putin against uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and all of these matters for our security. Uh, no one can tell uh, with certainty what the next war, the next crisis, the net, next threat will be. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, as long as we stand together, North America and Europe, and protect each other, we will be safe, we will be uh, secure. Uh, because together, NATO allies represent 50% of the world's economic might and 50% of the world's uh, uh, military might. So. Uh, as long as we stand together, we will be able to handle uh, any potential threat uh, and the challenge against our security. Well, I want to turn to the question of, you know, an increased defense spending, because at a time when there are so many challenges around the globe, and this can go, you know, from health to education to uh, climate crisis, why should governments be spending taxpayers' money on, you know, more tanks and bombs? So why this conversation about the increase in defense spending? Because without peace without security, uh, we will not manage uh, to cope with any of the other big challenges uh, we face, be it uh, uh, global uh, uh, warming, uh, uh, climate change, or uh, alleviating poverty, or um, making social and economic progress. All of that will be impossible uh, if we are not able to preserve peace, uh, to preserve uh, security for the one billion people that live in uh, NATO uh, countries. Uh, I, have been, um, I have been Minister of Finance, I've been uh, uh, Prime Minister for 10 years, I've been in different political positions over many years, and I really understand that it's hard to find money for defence, because all politicians always, uh, and I have been among them, would like to spend money on health, on education, on climate change, on all the other important tasks. But the reality is that uh, unless we succeed uh, when it comes to security, we will not succeed, succeed with the other tasks. And, the, and, and when the Cold War ended, um, um, after the Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War ended, uh, NATO allies, um, also my own country, Norway, we all reduced defence spending for many, many years uh, when tensions went down. But when we reduced defence spending, when tensions went down, uh, we, we, we have to be able to increase the defence spending and once again invest in defence when tensions are going up as they do uh, now. Uh, and the last thing I would say about defence spending is that uh, 
we have we have done it before. Also, as late as the beginning of the 1990s, at least the end of the 1980s, NATO allies in Europe uh, and Canada, we spent uh, roughly 3% of GDP on defense, which is significantly more than we spend today, because then we lived in a more dangerous world and then we invested more in our security. Well, I think we should open the floor to questions. We'll get started in Miami, where I know Donna is standing by, and we have a couple of questions for the Secretary General. Yes. Thank you so much, Carlota, and it is a great honor to the Secretary General. We have asked one member of the Aspen Youth Council and one of the winners of the Youth Summit Challenge to address a question. So, Vijay and Kissa, I'd love for you to come to the stage. Please introduce yourselves. We can grab that microphone. You can come on up and both come on at the same time. And you will introduce yourselves with your name, the country you're from, and then your question. Okay. All right. Good morning, Miami, and good afternoon, Sweden. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Kissa Jockney. I'm part of the Youth Council Summit. Um, and I'm originally from Pakistan, but I've lived in Chicago for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, General, thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge with us and answering some of the critical questions that we have. And one from me is with emerging technology shaping the future of warfare, how is NATO going to be responsive, adaptive, as well as ethical during these changes? Thank you so much. Thank you. And you can pass the microphone on to Vijay. Vijay, you may do the same. Hi. So my name is Vijay. I'm a senior at Yale and from Luxembourg. Um, thank you so much for, for taking my question today. Um, my question is about NATO strengthening relations with countries outside of the alliance, like Australia and Japan. What is NATO's mission in fostering those relationships? Um, and how do you respond to questions about NATO potentially overexposing itself, specifically in regions that intersect with China's sphere of interest? Thank you both for your smart, thoughtful questions. Carlota, back to you. Thank you. Well, let's begin with the first question about, you know, uh, emerging technology and how it is shaping warfare. Uh, I'll let you tackle that one first. Well, emerging disruptive technologies are changing the nature of warfare as much as the Industrial Revolution uh, did a couple of uh, centuries ago. Uh, because we see it uh, also in Ukraine, how cyber, how drones, how, uh, how uh, uh, autonomous systems are uh, uh, playing a very major role in the uh, warfare uh, in Ukraine. There's this paradox that you have trench warfare, which reminds us of the First World War, and then we have very advanced technologies applied to this uh, kind of classical uh, warfare. Uh, NATO uh, has been and continues to be the strongest and most successful line in its history uh, uh, for many reasons. But one of the reasons is that we have always been able to keep a technological edge uh, on our uh, potential adversaries. And we just need to make sure that we uh, maintain uh, uh, that technological edge. We do that by uh, now uh, 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 investing more in technology. We have established a new uh, fund, innovation fund. Uh, we have also established a network of, uh, uh, of uh, centers for developing uh, technology across the alliance. Uh, and all of this we do to partly ensure that NATO as an alliance, but also allies as allies, uh, ensure that they uh, invest in new uh, disruptive technologies, which are very linked to also uh, military capabilities. Artificial intel intelligence, uh, quantum computing, uh, of course it matters really for uh, how uh, weapons and weapon systems uh, will be applied and developed uh, today and in the future. We also need ethical guidelines. We're working on that uh, 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 for NATO allies. Uh, but most of all, we need to ensure uh, that uh, not only NATO allies, but also our potential adversaries have a minimum of ethical guidelines when they now uh, implement all these different technologies in their weapon systems. Um, uh, then uh, on uh, our partnership outside mm -hmm. NATO, uh, we have many partners. We have close to 40 partner nations uh, around the globe. But the question was primarily about our partners in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, we have four partners there, Japan, South Korea, 
uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, these are important partners for NATO. NATO is a regional alliance, alliance uh, North America and Europe, and NATO will remain a regional alliance. Article 5 of Collective Defense Clause will apply for NATO allies, uh, Europe and North America. But this region, the North Atlantic region, faces global threats. Cyber is a global threat. Space, which becomes more and more important for defense, is a global challenge, of course. Um, but also, for instance, China, uh, it's not about moving NATO to the Indo-Pacific, but it's about that China and global threats are coming closer to us. We see China in cyberspace, we see them in Africa, we see them in the Arctic, we see them trying to control critical infrastructure in our own countries. Uh, uh, so all of this matters for our security. In many ways, the war in Ukraine demonstrates that security is not regional, security is global. Uh, the main country that is enabling uh, Russia to conduct its war aggression against Ukraine in Europe is China. Uh, they are by far the biggest uh, trading partner for Russia. They are delivering a critical components to, uh, to their weapons, uh, micro uh, 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 electronics, uh, advanced technology, which is enabling Russia to build missiles, drones, a lot of other stuff, uh, which is key for their uh, uh, war against Ukraine. Um, so uh, we ha and then we have Iran, uh, and then we have uh, providing uh, drones. We have North Korea providing am ammunitions and uh, and uh, and weapons. So the the Asia, what is the the friends of Russia in Asia, Iran, uh, North Korea, and China, they are key for Russia's capability to fight against. Uh, 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 European um, friend, neighbor of NATO. So this idea that we can divide Asia from Europe doesn't work anymore. Uh, anymore. This is interlinked. And therefore, we also, of course, need to address the security challenges that China is uh, representing for our security. Well, let's turn to the newest member uh, of the alliance, where Sarah is standing by in Stockholm with uh, two more questions for the Secretary General. Thank you, Carlotta, and thank you for your time, Mr. Stoltenberg. Uh, we have two young participants here in the room. Uh, we have an international participant who also competed in the NATO Youth Challenge. Uh, and we also have a Swedish uh, participant asking uh, each a question. Um, please introduce yourselves, uh, tell us which country you're from, and uh, ask your question. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, my colleagues from Stockholm and also Miami. I am Bartosz Mościski, president of Polish Forum of Young Diplomats from Poland. I would like to ask about what should be the role of the alliance of NATO in the reconstruction process in Ukraine after the war ends. Last but not least, thank you for the years of your service for the alliance. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Ami Chavarle and I'm a political science student at the Swedish Defense University from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, I want to thank the organizers today for doing all of this. It's very nice that the youth, that the youth get a place to ask their questions. And I, and I also want to thank the Secretary General for answering our questions. Uh, the debate surrounding Sweden and Finland's entry in NATO have been characterized by how, <laughs> being characterized by how the organization will contribute or how the countries will contribute to the organization. But my question is how will the NATO membership contribute to these countries? Thank you. First, on the question about NATO's role in um, reconstruction of uh, Ukraine after the war. The first thing I will say is that, first of all, we need to ensure that Ukraine prevails. Because unless Ukraine prevails, there is nothing to reconstruct uh, in the free and independent uh, Ukraine. So the most immediate, the most important task now is to help Ukraine with military support, as NATO allies and NATO uh, do. Uh, we, we need to uh, sustain that. We need, need to make the support more predictable uh, uh, and more robust. And we are going to... Uh, hopefully make decisions on that, uh, not least at the NATO summit in uh, July. Uh, so yes, reconstruction in the future is important, but unless Ukraine prevails, there is nothing to reconstruct. And, uh, and second, the, the reconstruction will be very expensive. 
uh, but prevention is cheaper than, than, uh, than in a way repairing. So meaning that every air defense missile we can uh, provide to Ukraine will actually mean less damage, less destruction, and then also less need for reconstruction after the war. So, Does it go back to that notion of the increased defense spending then? Yeah, then? yeah absolutely. But the, the thing is that we, we, can, we must afford, we must be able to help Ukraine prevail uh, because it's important for Ukrainians, but also because every day this war uh, uh, drags on, of course, the more destruction and the more expensive, the more, the more uh, uh, resource the money it will be to do reconstruction afterwards. So I'm not saying that we should not think about reconstruction, but the precondition for reconstruction is to prevail. And, and the sooner Ukraine can prevail, the sooner this war can end uh, with a just and lasting peace where Ukraine uh, prevails as a sovereign independent nation in Europe, the less need there will be for costly uh, 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 reconstruction afterwards. Then on the issue of reconstruction, uh, of course, NATO will play uh, a key role in rebuilding defense and security institutions. Um, uh, we will uh, play a, a key role uh, in uh, also helping them uh, to uh, not only reconstruct their own country, but become a full-fledged member of uh, the alliance. We decided uh, uh, in Vilnius at the summit last summer uh, that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. We also made three important decisions to move them closer to NATO membership. Uh, we turned the whole process from a two-step process to a one-step process. We removed something called the membership action plan. Uh, so meaning that Na Ukraine doesn't have to go through a membership action plan. They can be, go straight for where they are now and be invited as a full-fledged member. So then we shorten down the process. Uh, second, we established something called the NATO-Ukraine Council, which is an important political body where we actually strengthen uh, our uh, political integration and cooperation with Ukraine and also make it easier for them uh, to join the alliance uh, at a later stage. And thirdly, we agreed a big program for interoperability. And interoperability is a difficult word uh, for ensuring that Ukraine and NATO allies can work together on communications, on operations, on everything. Um, and this program uh, will help them now, but to help them also in the future to, to build a, a force, a future force which is, which is fully in, interoperable, that can fully be integrated with NATO forces. So these are the things you have to do, uh, both in the short and the long uh, term, uh, ensure Ukraine prevails and help them to rebuild the country afterwards. Well, let's tackle the other question then, which was about, you know, uh, the other side of membership. What can NATO membership do to the newest members of the alliances? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, mm. Well, uh, first of all, NATO provides security guarantees. Mm. And that's the best security guarantee that ever has uh, exist. And that's Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, saying that an attack on one ally it will be regarded as an attack on all allies. So if you attack Sweden or you attack Finland or Norway or Belgium or whatever NATO ally, uh, then it will be regarded as the attack on 32 allies. And again, we are by far the strongest military power in uh, the world, 50% of the world's military might. So, the, so as long as we stand together, as long as we ensure that it's no room for misunderstanding in Moscow, or in any other capital that may be an adversary to NATO, there will be no military attack against any NATO ally. And that includes also Finland and Sweden, uh, because they realize that uh, an attack on one ally is an attack on all allies. So the first and most important thing that Finland and Sweden gets is uh, Article 5, is NATO's collective defense uh, clause, uh, uh, collective defense uh, security guarantees. Then, of course, they, 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 they get the opportunity to sit here at the NATO headquarters, to be fully part of this family, to sit at the council meetings just inside the meeting room over there, uh, and be equal around the table and take decisions, uh, and, uh, and be integrated in our political, our, our, our practical, our military cooperation. That's good for Finland and Sweden, but it's also, of course, good for, uh, for NATO, because Finland and Sweden brings a lot to NATO. Uh, so this is good for NATO, good for Finland and Sweden, and good for peace. Well, it would be remiss if we didn't turn to the audience here with us in Brussels. There is time for a few questions. So if anyone has a question for the Secretary General, could you put your hands up? Okay, I can see two here. One, two. And if you, we could follow the same format, could you introduce yourself, say where you're from, and we'll have the questions back to back, please. Sure. 
Um, hello, everyone in Miami and Stockholm, and good afternoon, sir. My name is Cornelia. I'm from Hungary. And my question would be, over the past 10 years of being Secretary General of NATO, what do you think was the biggest challenge, and on the other hand, the biggest accomplishment of the organization? Thank, Thank you. you. And second question, please. Yes, hello. My name is Tatum Brunton from Canada. My question for you is, did you always want to work in this field? And do you have any advice on youth professional career paths? Thank you. Thank you. Quite nice that uh, we got a bit more personal here in Brussels. Uh, as a first, uh, on the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge is and has been um, the war in Ukraine. Because all the other challenges I have faced uh, has, of course, been very serious, uh, but they have not had the same magnitude and not the same implications for NATO security and for peace in our region uh, as the full-fledged war in Ukraine. And I say full-fledged war on purpose because when I arrived in October 2014, uh, Russia has already annexed Crimea and they have already uh, uh, taken part of uh, eastern Ukraine or used their forces to control the eastern part of Ukraine. So the war in Ukraine didn't start in 2022, in February. It started back in 2014. But of course, the full-fledged war invasion in 2022 uh, uh, really changed uh, everything and has been by far the biggest and most serious challenge I have faced as Secretary General. Then the good news is that I've seen how allies have stepped up, how we have mobilized and uh, provided unprecedented support to, U to Ukraine. And also, I'm absolutely certain that, that President Putin totally underestimated the Ukrainians, their bravery, their, their determination to fight and protect their country. You have to remember that at the beginning of the war, most experts feared or believed that Ukraine uh, would fall within weeks, Kiev within days. That didn't happen. The Ukrainians have been able to liberate 50% of the territory that uh, Russia occupied in the beginning of the war. They have been able to inflict heavy losses on the Russian uh, occupiers and they have been able to open the corridor in the Black Sea and able to export uh, grains and, and other products. So these are big victories for Ukrainians, showing that they have the, 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 the determination, the bravery uh, to really uh, fight back. Uh, but Putin also underestimated NATO uh, and the unprecedented support we have been able to deliver to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. So this has been my biggest uh, uh, challenge. Uh, then the other question was... Uh, was, uh, was about if you always wanted to work in this field. No, not and at any all. Uh, advice no, as a, as a, for young professionals. I, no, as a, my, as a, first of all, my plan was never to become a politician. <laughs> that was the beginning. So I, I was a young politician when I was in my teen, I was in a teenager in the beginning of my 20s. Then I was active in the, also the Social Democratic Party of Norway. Uh, but then I decided to leave politics and to become uh, uh, an economist uh, to do uh, stat statistics and mathematics. So I started to do a PhD at the Central Bureau of Statistics in Norway. Uh, and my plan was to never, never engage in this kind of dirty <laughs> business of politics uh, because I wanted some uh, true, uh, uh, pure and, uh, uh, what should I say, serious stuff science. Uh, but then I was asked to become Deputy Minister for Environment in 1990. And I promised myself and my wife, wife only to do that for a year or two. <laughs> and then I ended up here uh, um, uh, because I stayed in politics. And to be honest, politics is very exciting because you actually do something. You can change the world. Uh, uh, of course, not as fast and not as uh, uh, always in the direction you really <laughs> want. But at least you, 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 uh, you're part of a process where things are changing and things are happening. Uh, and in democratic uh, countries, of course, you don't have, then you also have to face the voters. And some have lost elections, have won elections, and, uh, and I can tell it's better to win than to lose the elections. Uh, but, but you have to, do, you have to be able to do both uh, and to live with both. Uh, and then my plan was to work also on the international scene. I worked mostly on climate change um, uh, and also with a big campaign to immunize children, uh, uh, which is a very effective way to alleviate poverty. But then when I was asked by uh, President Obama and uh, Chancellor Merkel and the other leaders back in 2014, 
uh, to become Secretary General of NATO, I thought it was impossible to say no. Uh, and of course, I don't regret for a second that I said yes, uh, because it has been and is a privilege to serve at this great alliance with all these great people, with all these great nations. And also to have the, the honor of welcoming North Macedonia, um, uh, Montenegro, but also Finland and Sweden as, as, as members. And to, and to serve at a very critical time for our security. So, so I'm extremely privileged. I'm very happy that I had this opportunity, even though it has been a very challenging period, 2014 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 2024. Um, uh, but uh, but, uh, but yeah, that has been the privilege. So advice for uh, uh, young professionals is perhaps to you know, not be scared to deviate yeah. from the plan. Yeah. <laughs> the, the problem is that I, I, I never had a very clear uh, path or a clear idea uh, for what I should, uh, or should, should become, yeah. except for the one thing I didn't become. <laughs> uh, because I had one clear plan, and that was to not become a politician and to become a professor in mathematics and uh, statistics. That was my only clear uh, decision in life. Uh, and I failed totally. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So I think, I think, first of all, it is important to be devoted to what you do, uh, a bit regardless of exactly what you do. Uh, not think too much about the next job, but think more about the job you have, and not be uh, too afraid of authorities and bosses. That's really serious, the last <laughs> one. Uh, so, uh, so be yourself and uh, believe in yourself and, uh, and uh, be uh, nice to the, uh, all the people you work with, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, then something nice will happen. Well, I have one final question. I think this being the NATO Youth Summit, it is important to address, you know, everyone watching us, uh, of course, the audiences in, here in Brussels, in Stockholm and in Miami, about, you know, what, what parting words do you have to say for these young audiences about the future of our defense and security? Big question to end, yes. <laughs> we live in a more dangerous world, and we have to take that very seriously. At the same time, uh, NATO, is stronger and more united than we have been for decades. Uh, so as long as we ensure that we are united despite our differences, we are 32 countries from both sides of the Atlantic with different political parties in power with disagreements on many issues, uh, but we have always been able to unite around what is NATO's core task, and that is to protect and defend each other. Uh, NATO's purpose is not to fight the war, but NATO's purpose is to prevent the war is to deter war, is to make sure that there is no room for misunderstanding, that we protect and defend each other. And by doing that, NATO has been able to preserve peace for NATO allies, one billion people, for 75 years. So, yes, there is a more dangerous world, but at the same time, this alliance has proven extremely resilient, um, extremely capable, uh, and we are by far the most successful alliance in history for at least two reasons. One is that we have been united despite our differences. Uh, we see the value of standing together. Um, and second, we have been able to change when the world is changing. Uh, so as, so as long as we just keep this, uh, what should I say, big and sometimes a bit strange family together, uh, we will be safe. Uh, and then we can devote our time and our energy to, to climate change, to, to uh, education, to science, to all the other, to, to arts, to all the other beautiful things. Uh, so just make sure that NATO is, uh, as I say, strong and uh, united, then uh, we can devote time for other more beautiful activities. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg, thank you very much for your time today. I have no doubt that everyone watching us on both sides of the Atlantic found this to be a really inspiring conversation, uh, which will hopefully pave the way for further debate and conversation about the future of the Alliance. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Uh, well, that concludes the transatlantic conversation coming to you from the NATO HQ here in Brussels. The NATO Youth Summit will continue now with Donna in Miami. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General, for your insights and for showing all of us in the room and beyond that you can carve your own path. And thank you to Sarah and Carlota for helping facilitate this wonderful conversation. And thank you to all the thoughtful participants.